Hi, I'm Ian Borga, the Ward 5 City Councilor, and you're at the first Ward 5 Community Meeting of 2019. Can't even believe we're saying this. It's Tuesday, January 29th. We're inside the library at the Downey Elementary School, and we have a few topics this evening, but the primary one actually is uh, with our invited guest, uh, Ray, and uh, this is the Old Colony Planning Council, and he's a senior transportation planner. We've had Ray before because, let's face it, we have a lot of roads and streets in this city, and a lot of them could use some repairing. And in this case, this is a little bit more involved. This has to do with three main uh, intersections in, on the east side, in Ward 5, that affect a whole lot of people. Uh, as we found out when we did some research. And uh, Ray's going to give you a brief presentation. And remember, you have the opportunity to put some input. If you are on these streets, or you're on these roads, or you come into these intersections, you know the frustrations and the aggravations. So please feel free to you know, contact by email, phone call, writing, what have you, to you know, put your input. Because your input is vital. You own this, as I always say. You cannot put this city on eBay and unload it. You can't have a yard sale. It's yours. You own it. So you might as well have as much input as possible on it. And again, my name is Ann. This is the Ward 5 City Council meeting. And I can be reached at 774-297-4939. And uh, we're glad that people made it out tonight. And uh, I'll pass it over to Ray here. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm just going to pull this forward a little bit. Hopefully, people can see what uh, see the intersections that that we have. Um, my name is Raymond Garino, and I am a uh, as Ann said, I work for the Old Colony Planning Council. Uh, I'm a uh, transportation planner, and what we do at the Old Colony Planning Council is we uh, we offer planning services to our membership uh, communities, Brockton being uh, a member of uh, our, our uh, council. We have 17 communities around Brockton, and uh, we get our funding through state and federal uh, dollars. And we are right across the street from Brockton um, City Hall. We're at seven, uh, 70 School Street. So um, we're very convenient to Brockton. and. Uh, one of the things we do is we do transportation, traffic and transportation services, um, traffic studies, safety studies. So if any, anyone needs anything, just send a, a request to our director and they'll be happy to, uh, we'll do traffic counts or safety studies. And that's what Ann did. Ann asked us to do a, a safety study and uh, it focused on three intersections. Thatcher Street at Massasoit Boulevard, Thatcher Street at Pine Street, and Pine Street at Summer Street. Um, we did, we, we summarized it in the report, which I handed out. Uh, we call it a road safety audit. And a road safety audit uh, is when you have a multidiscipline team. So we ask first responders, we ask police officers in, in Brockton to do some research for us. They helped us with the uh, getting crash reports, uh, history of crash reports for three years for the intersections. We, uh, they also came to the road safety audit. We have fire, the fire department, the first responders. We had the uh, town engineer, the town planner. They were all invited. I'm not sure. I, I, I believe they did come They sent, or send a representative. I think the town planner was there. I think the town engineer was there also. Um, and, uh, also, Massasoit. We asked Massasoit to, to be there too. So it's a multi multidiscipline, uh, disciplinary effort, team effort. And basically, what we do is we we have a meeting, uh, in the and we we uh, ask people, you know, what is their experience? What are the problems at these intersections? Um, then then we go out to the intersection themselves, and we look and we look at traffic operations, and then. We go back to the uh, uh, meeting and we ask them, okay, what can we do now to uh, improve? Uh, what kind of improvements can we make? So what I'm going to do basically, I'm just going to go real quickly through each intersection and uh, look at our findings. And then if anybody has any questions, I can, I can take uh, questions. So 
so our first intersection was the intersection of that Thatcher Street and Massasoit Boulevard. Excuse me. Yep. Is there you can stand on the other side? Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm blocking the uh, view here. Thank so you. that's quite all right. So this is, uh, hopefully you can see this. It actually has two, um, two entrances and exits. And you, these are two T-type intersections with a single approach uh, off of Thatcher Street. So cars can, cars can either go in or out there, or they can go in and out here. It's like two intersections right next to each other. Um, this was originally the, supposed to be the main entrance, but since the other entrance off of Route 27 is actually you know, closer to other roads, people always use the other. But this, is, this gets a lot of traffic too. Um, there's this, uh, when, when school is out, there's, there's, the queues go back on here also. This drive over here uh, is to the, I guess there's a uh, um, property that's owned by uh, uh, the Catholic Church or, or the nunnery. And, um, and potentially, that, that has potential to, to be developed for residential. Um, so we went out there and we looked at, at the traffic issues. And I guess uh, one of the issues was this curve in the road here. Which kind of and, and this 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 is skewed the angle is skewed a little bit here. Most of the people use this, and uh, what happens is um, heavy vehicles have a hard time making the turns here. It also uh, limits sight distance uh, to this side here. So I'm looking at page seven. So the safety issue was the curve and the skewed skewed intersection. Also, there are delays uh, when classes let out in the afternoon. Uh, that was the issue that we, we discussed. And then it said the enhancements, okay, what can we do about it? Um, some of the long-term, um, there's, there's a lot of different things that could happen here. Um, they could, uh, they could re realign, they could, they could combine these and, and rebuild the road. That's, you know, obviously it's a, an expensive thing to do, but oh, they could just leave it like this but they could uh, they could move it so that it's and 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 reconstruct the intersection so so that uh, it, it's not so skewed. If if and when this is developed here, the the uh, the city could ask ask them if they put a driveway to put it here so it's across from here. Because right now you'd you'd have some conflicts, people coming in and out of here. They'd be conflicting with vehicle movements here, so that that's an issue right there. It's something that you could avoid by planning for the future. The other the other um, options. A lot of these are options. So so the, these these studies are in the pre-planning stage, really pre-design. We're, we're just sort of um, a think tank of, you know, different options that the, that the city can think about. Um, one of the options was a all-way stop with flashing beacons, or you could put flashing beacons with um, just a stop on, on here. Uh, what flashing beacons do, it helps with visibility, so cars coming up and down, Thatcher can see that there's, a, that there's cars moving in and out of that uh, intersection. Um, the other long-term uh, improvement is signal signalization. Um, traffic signals uh, could be put there. Again, that's more expensive long-term um, uh, long treatment. Um, they could widen. Massasoit Boulevard could be widened to allow, because of the heavy vehicles, uh, mostly the buses turning in and out, another long-term. Um, another issue on Thatcher Street was speeding. Uh, so, um, so uh, enforcement, enhanced enforcement, uh, was was one of the things that that for uh, for treatment. Uh, pedestrian amenities. There are no the the pedestrian amenities. Um, there's a lack of sidewalks and safe pedestrian crossings. 
And uh, in the wintertime, plowed <coughs> snowbanks force walkers to walk in the street. So there's a lack of pedestrians. You can see there's no crosswalks here, and there's, there's a lack of um, uh, uh, sidewalks. Now, the other thing is, this is actually, believe it or not, this is actually a designated route for bicycles, regional route. It's the Claire Salt and Stall um, bicycle route. Um, and uh, there are no amenities for bicycles. There's really no, no place for bicycle to, bicycles to, um, to go. So it's basically on a map. You have you know, a line on a map. But it is a designated route for bicycles. A lot of people probably don't know that. Um, the other issues was there were there there's a, a lack of wayfinding signs, so people wouldn't know that you know that, that um, which way you know that there's there's a college there. Um, improved lighting um, on the street also. So those are, those are the things that we, we talked about there. And like I said, this is pre-design. And, um, and it, these are some of the options that the, that the city could look at. So if anybody has any questions or comments about this, I'll be, yes, sir. Well, for vehicle safety, want low low cost. That these um, that's one thing I should mention that in in this report, there's a there's a matrix here, and it tells you whether it's uh, low cost or high cost, and so uh, some of the things that I went over. So signage, things like signage are low cost. Uh, flashing beacons, not a lot of money. Um, anything that where you have to put a shovel in the ground, um, like I talked about. Uh, moving, moving this over and, and re, uh, reconstructing, that's going to be long-term expensive. Anything with signage is going to be uh, less expensive. Flashing beacons, that, that, those kind of treatments, um, as far as getting the most for your money. Um, there, there, is, there are some, it, it's kind of strange because there, there are some police officers who say those flashing beacons, like if you have a, a yellow on here and red on the stop signs. There are some police officers that say they're useless. And then there are some police officers that say, I'm glad we put that there because now people stop at the stop sign and now they look and they see there, there's, a, <laughs> there's an intersection there. So, so I, think, I, I think the reason for that is because it, every situation is different. So out in a small town uh, like Plimpton where they put a flashing beacon and the police officers were great. They were they really liked it because there was a lack of lighting, and people didn't even know there was a, an intersecting road there, and they would get into crashes. But they saw the flashing beacon, so it cut down on a lot of crashes, and they liked it a lot. But in an urban setting, it might not be as effective. So so sometimes it's more effective in some places than others, you know. Um, so, like you say, there's not a lot of crashes there, so it it it, it might not be worth it to spend a lot of money. Um, however. I would recommend, uh, because you, you could, during the site uh, design uh, phase of this, pro if the project comes in, to have them do that with no, no real cost to the, to the city. So that might be worth it, because they're going to put shovels in the ground anyways. You know, don't let them use a, a, a driveway that's going to be, actually make the situation worse. Uh, I, I would recommend that, you know. Kind of a long answer to a <laughs> to a question, but all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move to the to our next intersection. Like I said, there were three intersections.
By the way, Ann was with us. This, she was out in the field with us, and uh, she was part of the uh, part of the group. Our next intersection was Pine Street at Thatcher Street. Pine Street, uh, Thatcher Street here is two ways, but here it's one way. So, so there's, uh, there's a lot of right turns here and a lot of left turns coming up here. And um, so, and this is a stop sign right here. And it's, it's a skewed, you can see the intersection is skewed like that also. Um, so, the alignment, that was the first thing we, we documented was the poor intersection alignment. Um, so one of the remedies of obviously is to, you could, you could, you know, relocate the road. And once again, uh, you could, you could probably come up this way here, make a T right here, since there's buildings on this side, a more expensive long term. But there's, there are other things that are short term like move the stop line up here. We, we, we actually sketched it on this. So, so people have to come up here and stop here and go left. What's, what's happening is, since there's a lot of right turns here, um, every once in a while there's a car that goes straight through and these people expect these people to take a right turn so they'd go left, not realizing these people are actually going straight through. So it's, it, there is a little bit of driver confusion at this intersection. Um, the other thing um, they, that uh, we talked about was rather than move, relocate this road, was pu pull out the corner here and, and just make it like a T in this, this way here. So just move the curb out rather than have it really flat where people are going in a fast, they're taking this right turn really fast. This would slow them down because they'd have to come up here and then then turn right. So that was another, uh, not so not so expensive, but it still involves you know shovels in the ground. Yep. There there is a sign there that, that that was yeah that was one thing that we noticed that the signs need updating. Because they're they're old and they're they're kind of faded, there is a one-way sign there somewhere, but it's hard to find. And the, and the street signs also, uh, that's one of the things we we noted on here. Let's see. Um, yeah, traffic, the traffic control signs are faded or missing. Yep, and uh, also again wayfinding. Uh, so people can find their uh, different, uh, like the school or, or things like that. So uh, the uh, recommendations were to reposition the street signs for better visibility, provide wayfinding signs for St. Joseph Michael Center and Massasoit uh, campus. Yeah, the stop signs and the one-way signs for Pine Street need to be upgraded and repositioning for better visibility. So there is a there is a uh, one-way sign, but it's it's hard to see it. It's hard to find it. Um, once again, uh, there's a lack of pedestrian uh, amenities, um, and there's also uh, no bicycle lanes. So, any other questions or? Um, well, you you probably don't have enough room for them. That's true. Yep. But, but you can, what, some, one of the things when, when you run into that kind of situation is that you could put signs up. You could also put what's called sharrows, which are pavement markings that said that, that notify, um, notify motorists that they have to share the lane. This is a great opportunity, even though I don't know if there's enough room in the right of way here. It might be uh, there's some shoulder here on Thatcher Street where you could actually, you might be able to fit a bicycle lane. Uh, there's, a, there's a campus there. I know a lot of a lot of the students are working students, but it, but it, it it would be sometimes it's good if you provide them a bicycle lane 
and provide them the amenities, there, there are some that actually might use it. Not everybody uh, uses a car, you know. I would think sidewalks would help. Yep. Really because I walk that area. Yeah. You walk in the street. Right, right. So right. Be great. Yeah, yeah, there's a lack of sidewalks here, yeah, definitely. Yep. But on the one way, mm -hmm. You could put a bicycle lane there. Yeah, you could, you could, you could put like a four or five foot bicycle lane on the side here. Absolutely. Yeah, but over here where you don't have enough room, you could you could put down pavement markings that say Sharrows, that say share the lane, and you could put a you can put a, a sign up also that tell people to, to you have to share the lane. Believe it or not, there's a lot of people that drive cars. They don't realize that in Massachusetts, there's a law you have to share the road with with a um, bicycle. You know. Most definitely, yeah. They can put they can put a, a stop line that's that's thicker, thicker stop line here, and and because the the stop uh, the pavement markings are faded, yeah. Most definitely, uh, visual cues are very important. Have something? Oh. Well, huh. they're talking about building a building up there that's going to add traffic to this. Right. Is this included in that thought process? No, this is no. If if the, this is totally separate, so whoever whoever uh, takes that property, they're going to have to you know there's a, a site uh, review process in the in the city. And at that time, hopefully, that the, the city will talk to them about uh, if, if and when they get approved, if they, they might get approved, they might not, whatever happens, then they're going to have to deal with their own, with, with the impact that they make on here. So this, this has nothing to do with them. This was, a, this was a safety audit that we were asked to do for three different intersections. Um, so. Right. Um, you could you could make you could talk about it if you want, but I I, I I was here to to talk about this specific road safety audit for the three intersections. But you can make comments about that. I'm sure if you want to, you can ask questions. If if I have any answers to it, I could try to answer any questions. You you have a qu comment about Pine Street or? The speeds are are high. Yeah, definitely lack of lack of uh, sidewalks mm -hmm. and high speeds. It's not a good combination for residential neighborhoods. I, I agree. Right. Why we're holding the meeting here is because a lot of the people
come down Pine Street to get to the Downs. Yes. Yeah. Or just to avoid the, um, the lights of um, presence. Yes. I mean, yeah. trucks are flying down yeah. the street, too. I see. Oh, yeah. Numerous oh, trucks yeah. flying down the street. Yeah, yeah. Ann made that point at, at the road safety audit that there was a lot of trucks on Thatcher and Pine Street making those turns and um, going yeah, through the neighborhoods. To, yep. Shortcuts and what have you. I mean, some instances they were definitely going to do deliveries, especially now with everybody getting, you know, ordering online or whatever. You see a ton of delivery mm -hmm. trucks. But as a whole, it's um, that's one of the things we want to emphasize. Don't hesitate to hint that we need more um, traffic enforcement. <laughs> yeah, uh, traffic enforcement is always good. Yes. Yeah. Visibility, visibility is always good. Yes, yes, yes. Because... Uh, they still going down the long way, too. Oh, yes. Remember we talked about that? What's that? The, the sign, how mm -hmm. Pine Street turns around and, and becomes a one-way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They turned it around. Yeah. They turned the sign. Yes. Yeah. 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 The, the other thing you, the other thing that, that we didn't mention, I don't think it's in here, is that um, I don't know if the city has invested in a uh, a speed trailer. Um, that's something that a lot of uh, towns are are using. It's it's uh, it's a trailer. It's like a it's, it's like a sign and it's radar and it tells you how how fast you're going. And and the good thing is it's portable, so you can put it on you put it on Thatcher Street one one week and the other week it could be on a different street and um, it's been proven that it does it does help to, to cut down on speeding, and they're not too ex yeah they're not too expensive. I, I hate to say in Brogdon it's not going to matter. People know that nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a highway. Yeah. They they have they they use them in uh, not a portable one, but in they they installed one on Route 106 in Halifax. <laughs> And it helps uh, near the school, and it, 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 it yeah. It, they light up if you're going too fast. Police fire. Yeah. Right. Right. But there's no police around, and everybody in Brockton knows it, so right. they go, yeah. "Oh well, huh, all right, that's a cute, cool noise." Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to. We have one more intersection left, uh, and that is Summer Street at Pine Street. Yeah. So. Our other, the intersection that we were just talking about, that street is here. Yeah. Up here is Pine and uh, Summer Street. This intersection is stop signed on Pine Street here. Uh, again, it's, it's not exactly a, a conventional intersection because it's skewed. It's almost like a Y type intersection. Vehicles, when they come up here and stop at the stop sign, there's a wall here that the, the sight distance is limited. Uh, down in this way. Exactly. Summer Street, high speeds on Summer Street. I think there's a grade here and they really come come down this grade really fast. Um, there's, a, there's actually wide enough here for a left turn lane, storage lane right there. There is a left turn. Yep. Um, so once again we in our in our report we noted the, the poor sight lines, the uh, and the uh, poor alignment. Um, long term expensive you know we have a, we have the we always have the uh, option of reconstructing but that takes a lot of money um, some people talk about a roundabout roundabouts are traffic calming roundabouts are good they get traffic down to 20, 20 miles per hour and they keep traffic moving a lot of people think that they're problematic but they're really not they're they're pretty good this intersection also uh, it uh, meets the thresholds for installation of a traffic signal, so that's another option. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, vehicles on Summer Street speeding. Um, Well, the, the, there is, a, there is a, um, a law that Massachusetts passed a new law that allows uh, towns to adopt speed zones, uh, safety zones. So that's something that maybe Ann could, she's not here right now, she just stepped out, but there's something that, um, that she could pursue. Um, I think uh, 
Hanover, Hanover is adopting a safety zone. So it's a, it's a new law that was uh, passed and, and the, uh, the city could look into that, create, create uh, safety zones. Oh. The left onto Pine Street. Okay, so they're, ba they're backed up from, from this signal from here, they're backed up all the way down here. Yeah. Because yeah. I live, I can see it from my house. Mm -hmm. And the other night I noticed that it was backed up to the light at about 515. Right. That, that's not good either. So no, it isn't, no. You have people trying to take that, that left. Right. People and trying to. People coming off, mm -hmm. you know, trying to also take a left. They can't take a left. Right. So it's actually a real and the visibility is uh, There's a lot of visibility issues. There, yep. Uh, you know, with uh, walls so and that wall. type of thing. Yeah, that was, yeah, we noticed that wall, and um, yeah, the only thing you can do is ask, that is ask the owner if they would cooperate. It's it's totally up to them. Um, uh, the Some other went through it a month ago, so yeah, yeah. Probably um, the other thing we noticed that drainage is, uh, I guess, the water. You could you could see all the it's sort of dusty down here where where the tailings from the water coming down the hill. The drainage is insufficient, so they have to take a look at that. Um, it's not a good. Uh, not a good thing there. So, and we were talking about uh, there's a new state law where you, where a municipality can uh, establish uh, safety zones, speed zones. Okay. So uh, that's my. Yep. <laughs> so that's something you might be able to do for Pine Street. Okay. Um, and actually, and uh, Summer Street. Okay. Um, So on, on the bottom of page 11, you can see where uh, table two, it has an estimated time frame and cost breakdown. So some of these, uh, some of these uh, recommendations are short term, mid term or long term and, and low cost, medium cost, high cost. In our matrix uh, on page 12, you can see where they're they're categorized, the safety issue, the, the, the potential safety uh, recommendation or enhancement, and you can see the time frame, the cost, whether there would be high cost or medium cost. And uh, so, so these are, like I said, this is really pre-design. This is all, um, the, the, the city has the option of saying, okay, we wanna, you know, we wanna put up, say, a flashing beacon or or we want to we want to signalize this intersection, but like you say, if the other intersection is already at the fair, it might not be worth it because they're. But whatever whatever um, project you might come up with, maybe drainage, uh, maybe realigning the intersection so that you have better sight distance. Although again, it's built up, There's, the houses are right up against it, so you'd have probably have to have a right away. So it's, every everything is uh, cost money extra, unfortunately. But whatever the town, whatever option the town wants, they can. You, you can try. You can see. You can try to get a, a glimpse of what what you might need there. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I have a question for Ann. Yep. Yep. Um, I live here on well, the Electric Avenue. Yes. And I noticed everything you're talking about Pine Street and Summer Street is happening right here with the school buses coming through. Mm -hmm. They speed up and down Crescent Street. Mm -hmm. They don't stop even when the school time is out. They need a beacon light, as you're saying. I know that there are signs, there are um, monitors that have signs holding up, but that oh, yeah. doesn't do any good. Um, people still, you know, when they have buses that come back and forth and there's a lot of serious heavy trafficking. Um, the other piece is that the drainage on the street Mm -hmm. is really poor and you need some type of a side drainage mm -hmm. because in the winter time 
is for visibility, even though this is a short street here. Yep. For visibility, you have students walking as well as riding on the buses, and you need something there to, as well. The whole street needs to be, how would you say, uh, repaved or something? Yep. With some type of a drainage because it, it's all coming from the hill. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, over here was is something like a marsh or something over here, it used to be, or something over here. Uh, I'm just speaking because I'm not sure. Yeah. But this is on a hill, and in winter time is really bad. It blows down, causes ice and everything. You have students are getting walking. <coughs> Buses are skidding on the street all the time. Yeah. And uh, I think that they need to redo this street as far as the drainage and paving the street. Put one of those beacon lights you're talking about at the foot base of the street. I mean, this is a school here. Right. And you do have a lot of people going back and forth. Right. So you're talking about a flashing beacon at electric and Route 27, yes, flashing because overhead beacon. All, all right, because I, I, I agree, because when I, when I came here, I've never been here before, I almost passed the street. It's hard to see, right. see where the street is. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's, the lighting is really bad on the right. street, and, as well as making the turn. Right. When it's snowing, like we've like we had uh, the other day with the ice and the snow and everything, mm -hmm. it was really bad. Even though school was mm -hmm. out, you know, or, or half a day or whatever, it's really a bad intersection for the buses to come up and down right. the street. And yeah, and I noticed there's a grade, like you say, there's a grade, it comes down. The, the pavement is in very poor condition. Right. And if you, have, if you have poor drainage, what that does is that, that, that creates an even worse situation for your pavement because when your pavement starts to crack, the water gets inside. And it gets inside, then it freezes and, and it and it, and it, 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 and it moves have, everything. Once you, you lose your base, once you lose your, your base, then, then you have to reconstruct the whole road. Right. So, yeah, this... this, this uh, what happens to, while you're doing this reconstruction, what happens to all the school buses that need to come to school, the children need right. to come to school, so that really needs right. to be looked at. Yeah. yeah I agree. Yep. It's good that you have a school committee, Julie Sullivan, here for work. We're just a, I was watching and listening to everything you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Everything you're saying about Summer Street, Pine Street, mm -hmm. is happening right here. Right. And the, and the other thing is, I noticed the, um, the, the, flashing, the flashing school, you know, you have the 20 mile per hour. It's too close to electric speed. It needs to be moved out this way because if you have a flashing, you know, school's in session, you want 20 miles per hour, you're already on top of the street. <laughs> Right. You know what I'm they saying? They need to slow down because the guys do a, an excellent job in mm -hmm. trying to stop this car so mm -hmm. let the school buses go in and come out. Right. But right. it doesn't do any good. People have got to go to work. They're rushing and they should not be. Right. Um, right. The buses come through. Mm -hmm. Some, like you said, you know, there's sidewalks on both sides, but there's only one sidewalk on the street. Yeah. So yeah. you don't have any type of a passageway going back and forth. Right. I right. just think it's more of a serious thing with it, especially with the drainage and that's that corner because they can only do so much to make those people stop and let the school buses and the, and the parents to drop off their children they have to go to work you know it becomes a, a traffic thing yep. and, and if you don't slow down they, they keep flying because yep. I can't hardly get off the street sometimes yeah, yeah when there's no school I just go down the street and I'm trying to go either way yep. I can't even they're flying up and down Crescent Street yep. I, I totally agree with you. I, yep. My children come to the school and I drive them here every morning and afternoon. Right. I, in the morning, I just pray to God that the wonderful gentlemen that meet these people here are out there. Down. So they're, they're amazing. I mean, I just yeah. thank God because even leaving here, I got to cross the road in the car. Yeah. And it's such a busy street. So it's, it's very, very scary. Well, they do a good they job, do a but they can't, job. they can't do everything. They can't, they can't. Because of the traffic. No, I'm trying to tell you that all the schools job. have this kind of problem. Mm -hmm. You know, beginning and end of the day, mm -hmm. because of the number of paths in there. But look at the winter Getting time the and the and snow and, and everything else, and, look at the, and, the, and the trafficking. It, it really, somebody needs to do a traffic study right at that corner. Yeah. And up I mean, and down really the street. Twenty-seven, very busy. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So that's um, yeah, no, that that's useful information. Um, definitely need some improvements on mm -hmm. on the street. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, like I said, I'm with the uh, Old Colony Planning Council. Um, we're um, in our information, other information. We're on 70 School Street. We're online. Um,
ocpcrpa.org. I don't think it's on here, but um, we're right across from City Hall if anyone has any more questions or um, uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Ray. I appreciate it. And I know that there's this couple here that lives on Pine Street and apparently takes their life in their hands after they get out of their car. Really would like to talk to you. And I'm glad <coughs> that Jackie was able to talk about Electric Ave. And that, um, just so people understand, we have a, a traffic commission in this city and people are welcome. It's 11 times a year that they meet and you're all welcome to attend and, you know, and discuss certain concerns, et cetera. It's usually the last Thursday night of um, the month, but it's the fourth Thursday night should there be five Thursday nights <laughs> in a month. But anyway, I want to thank you, Ray. And everybody needs to understand, Ray works in the Thomas Edison building. Okay, he works for this region, not for the city. So he could be doing a presentation tomorrow in uh, Plimpton and another one in... Uh, what, uh, Stoughton on another night or what have you, because this is, this is what he does, studying all this and, you know, with what, the background in engineering and planning and what have you. So anyway, want to thank uh, Ray. And um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to, you know, speak, you know, connect up with Ray. There's some business cards there. And there's more opportunities for, um, I'm sorry, the research um, that you've done. Any input you provide is vital. And again, they, there's always this opportunity situation where we refer to as uh, grant applications for road repair, renovations, and uh, traffic uh, changes. So anyway, I want to thank you again. Um, we're at the Ward 5 meeting, and uh, we want to ask Ron Freddy, who is in downtown Broughton also, just a big downtown thing today. And um, he's going to talk about uh, free services <coughs> that uh, can help an awful lot of people. And um, also, he's looking for volunteers if anyone's interested in doing something different. So I'm going to pass it on to Ron. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that introduction, Ann said everything I was going to say. <laughs> thank you, Ann. Uh, Ann likes to invite me to this meeting, and thank you for having me uh, to talk about our program. And uh, I'd like to go through the who, what, when, where, and why of our program. Who we are, we're the Greater Procton Center for Dispute Resolution. My name is Ron Freddy. I'm the program coordinator. Uh, I'm in my 12th year. Uh, our office is located in the courthouse at 215 Main Street. That's the district courthouse. We're on the second floor in room 207. Uh, we do have walk-ins. Uh, we are available through our website of www.gbcdr.org. Our email address is in the card that I gave you. It's mediators at gbcdr.org. And what we do is we provide free mediation services to the court and to the general public. So we call that community mediation. We're funded by a few state agencies. One of the agencies is the Attorney General's Office. And what we do is we educate the public on consumer information. We're also funded by the Massachusetts Office of Public Collaboration for community mediation. And that means neighborhood type of disputes, as well as uh, family disputes. We do divorce mediation. We do post-divorce mediation. Uh, we don't do legal work, but we do uh, have a referral uh, list of contacts where we can refer people to various legal departments if that's what they need, some on sliding scales, uh, some that are local to our jurisdiction. Uh, we service 29 communities in and around the greater Brockton area, uh, so we're quite busy, but we're always available to help those people, particularly those people that are in Ward 5. Okay. So, um, how this works is that I am the only paid staff member at the present time, and we use, uh, we use trained volunteer mediators to work on small claims, juvenile cases, uh, we also run a conciliation program that we do uh, civil cases in the Brockton District Court. Uh, but particularly, what we're doing this year is we're reaching out more and more to the communities and uh, favoring community mediation, because that's where our expertise can be put to use. So if you know of anybody that has a dispute, maybe somebody in your family uh, may have need of our services, the key is it is a free service. 
and it costs nothing to call, costs nothing to inquire to see if we can uh, assist you. And that's pretty much it. Do you, um, um, do we refer to, do you want to not me. thank you. People um, in the back in here. Do you need, do you have, um, do you share referrals out for people that have mediations, especially with persons or families or individuals um, needing some type of a, a mental health counseling or any type of a counseling? I didn't see that in here this past. Uh, no, we just refer them to like a Bay State counseling and those types okay, of things. Bay State yeah. counseling, yeah. okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank Ron again. And, uh, you know, this information is available all the time. And please take advantage. You might know someone that needs these services. And I've run into a few people. And what uh, Ron, you know, can do if you need to have a situation where you can't be in your home, or in fact, if you can't leave your home because of physical challenges, it can, you know, make, make some, some arrangements. And I know he's been able to help some people. And what one of women is always eternally grateful that he helped her out with uh, just getting her, you know, situation in order, you know, should, uh, you know, when the time arrives and uh, didn't uh, cost her anything except for any court documents that are uh, necessary. So I want to emphasize that again. That's in downtown Broughton at the, what everyone refers to as the new courthouse, but I think it's funny, it's the district court. So anyway, again, I want to thank everybody for coming along here. The next person I'm going to have uh, speak is our school committee person to give a little update. And she's going to be followed by Terry McIntosh for a few moments and Lynn Smith. And we'll do a whole wind down with our Ward 4 City Councilor, Susan DeCastro. So tons of information night. OK, here we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I am the Ward 5 School Committee person. And I have a few little things that I can um, present to you tonight. Um, one of the residents did call me, and, or I just saw it on Facebook, that there's questions about teacher absences and substitutes. So I didn't get specific questions, so I'm going to give you just a general idea. Teachers can be absent for having leaves of absence, they, resignations, maternity leave, retirement. They have sick days and personal days. Okay? Um, so... If your, if your child's teacher is out, then it's one of those reasons, okay? And everything has to be approved. Substitutes uh, get, right now, $85 a day. The school committee did, um, will be voting on this soon to raise the substitute pay up to $90 a day um, It's because they're having a hard time getting substitutes, okay? Substitute has to have two years of college. It doesn't have to be in education, but they have to have two years of college in order to sign up. Okay, also we have a change in the um, superintendent's secretary. We have a new secretary, Melinda Campbell, and Wanda Alves has retired after many years of doing that and working in the Brockton Public Schools. Wanda did a great job. Um, okay. Also, the... Um, Mr. Minicello did report that we are pursuing interest in the lawsuit. We have put together a competent team of lawyers who are doing a lot of legal work, pro bono. We have engaged an individual who is coordinating the efforts across the communities and organizing things to go in the right direction. This is for the equity in education lawsuit for the state that the school committee is working on. The goal on our end is to continue forward, be prepared to file in the next couple of months, a very competent lawsuit to keep the pressure on the state to ensure that everybody, anything done by the legislature is done with the best interests of the communities. There will be a presentation to the uh, community about this coming up. There will be a public um, presentation. Um, Superintendent Smith was um, evaluated by the school committee and her ratings go up every year. She is... Um, got this vision of instructional excellence for every student. She works very hard to share this vision, and it is evident in her work every day. The superintendent con conduct reflects the needs of our students and is absolute priority. She's always working on ad advocacy with the school committee. Right, let's see 
what else we have? Okay. With the impact of the inequitable funding, there's been a loss of 200 teaching jobs, 20 administration, administrative positions over the last five years. Classroom instability happens because of these kind of cuts. Cuts to key curriculum, administrators, inability to support classroom teachers, and lack of updated research-based curriculum. What we're doing to rectify that is the superintendent and the school committee are adopting K-5 to high-quality research fake resources in literacy and math. We're providing job-embedded professional development. We're developing a two-year school improvement plan for the schools that are falling a, li falling a little bit below. The, we also voted on to renovate, completely renovate North Middle School and a new roof for the Huntington School. A lot of parents were kind of um, you know, get flustered when there's a delayed school opening. When the school is delayed by one hour, 90 minutes, 120 minutes, that means school starts 90 minutes after the regular start. Okay, 120 minutes after the regular start. And extended day does not open until 8 a.m. And a lot of parents will want to get to work really quick, so they'll drop their kids off at the schools. There's no supervision before the, the start of school. So if it's an hour delayed, you cannot drop them off at the regular time. That's another thing that really kind of flusters the parents and the schools. All right, so that's my report for tonight. If anybody has a question, we have my cards up here, and you can contact me at any time. Jean? So just back to the um, sub-situation, and I don't know what the particular person's question was, but... I know, I didn't get the specific question, okay. so it's so kind of odd. I guess my first question is, do, we st do they still have what's called absent without a sub up at the high school? If they can't find a sub, then there's no sub, and they have been having trouble doing that. Okay. So but all towns are having trouble. I sub in Weymouth, and they can't find them either, but their pay is much lower. But they've had this system of absent without a sub at the high school since as far as... Where they go for the study? Right. Yeah. So since 2005, at least, they've been following that procedure. So is that still the procedure up at the high school that they're doing that? Yeah. Well, if there's no sub, there's no one to teach the class, so they have to go to the cafeteria, right? Yeah. And do they do that in the lower schools as well? No. That's only done at the high school. Okay. I don't know about the middle schools. I can find out. No, that's not done in the elementaries. You know, someone comes in, either a para or the principal does it, you know? I mean, if you don't have, if you can't find a sub, it, it really upsets the whole school, you know? Because, I mean, if kids' classrooms have to be covered, you know? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that Brockton Public Schools was in violation of state law as it relates to structured learning time, and the um, state did find them in violation um, back in 2000 and I think it was 2007 or 2008 because the fact of the matter is is that when you have absent without a sub, that is simply a study and that doesn't count towards the structural yeah. learning time that's required by law. So that's why I was asking. Right, right, yeah. I don't, I don't remember that happening in 2007. I mean, it was here then. Yeah. So I, I didn't hear about that. Yep. <laughs> I guess there's some things I don't know. <laughs> so Sackowitz knew about it, <laughs> as did Maria Laporte. Okay. And, and they were found in violation. Well, I'm, I'm sure they've rectified that, but they do still go to the calves if there's no sub. So there's no, there's nothing else they can do. I mean, if they don't have a teacher, you I, know. I, I appreciate the problem, but the fact of the matter is, is that they are violating state law if they don't have substitutes in the classrooms for the kids. Um, so, and, and I, you know, I was the one who brought it to the attention of the state. Uh, I was the one that led the charge and the reason that the state found them in violation was because I brought it forth and proved that they were in violation of the structured learning hours that are required for our high school students. Um, and I can appreciate that they don't have subs, but I, I just cannot imagine uh, that, um, I think that there's a degree of poor planning. I think that the teachers could be doing a better job of planning um, for when they're gonna be absent, that there's work that they can provide um, oh, there's always students. work left when they're, when they're, you know, but that's a, well, a substitute. never was. That's a substitute plan that's left for right, the substitute. But, but my point is if you don't have... Someone has to teach it. Right. Somebody has to implement yep. it. Yep, somebody has to... Okay. Yeah. 
Do you know how the $90 compares to the surrounding communities? Well, I'm going to tell you, Weymouth pays 75 a day. Um, Braintree pays 100 a day. The South Shore Charter in Norwell pays 100 a day. Um, I know Abington pays 75 a day, too. So do you think the, the daily pay is directly related to our ability to... Yeah, because if you, if you really divide it all out with the um, 75 a day, you really only make a minimum wage to come in and substitute a class. They find that that's a big reason why a sub would accept an assignment or not. Yeah, they are finding that you know if the pay is low, yeah, then they you know like Weymouth is really can't find any subs right now. That wasn't true last year because I subbed there last year too, but really it's a it's a real problem. You know, all school systems are being affected by it. You know, so I mean it's a tough job. You you don't know where you're going every day you come in, so you really have to have. You know, like retired people do it, retired teachers do it. But you know? why would we go up five dollars instead of going to attract to more people to come in and want to do it? But why wouldn't we go to a hundred or a hundred and twenty that would make great substitutes? Because we don't have the money to do that. We almost didn't have the money to do the ninety. Yeah, I mean, two hundred teaching positions eliminated and twenty administrative. You know, that's serious. You know, this, the learning is, it, it, is affected because of that. You know, and the scores are down. You know, even though the teachers are working very hard, the superintendent and the school committee are working hard, that's why we're going to have the lawsuit. You know? And that, that lawsuit is uh, based on the, what, the calculation of the foundation budget? Yes. It's, it's because of the foundation review committee, you know, found that Brockton is not properly being funded. Is that, has that lawsuit been filed yet? Within the next couple of months it will be, yep. There's a whole process with it with the lawyers and you have to have a plaintiff and, you know, all that. What does Brockton do to advertise for substitute teachers? So in other words, you only need to have two years of college, so most people that have gone through Massasoit would qualify to be a substitute right. teacher. So are we recruiting from the college or what is the city doing as it relates to that to, to get subs? Um, they advertise for it, you know, just like every other school system does. And um, I, I've just never seen it advertised, that's why I was asking. You know, um, it's on, it's on um, the internet, you know, the Indeed, the education sites, the Indeed, the school spring. Yeah, all jobs are posted there. And where, if someone, just for purposes of the, the media, so where would someone, uh, who could someone contact if they want to be a substitute teacher here in the city of Brockton? You would go on the Brockton Public Schools website and you can apply right there. www.bpsm.org. The BrockenPublicSchools.org. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So then go right on the website, they can apply right there. It's done all on the web now. Yep, there's not, not all that paper stuff that you have to do anymore. Everything is quick. Hello. I can get those numbers for you, but I would have had to have it before. Sure, but, sure. but yeah, I can get those numbers for you, I can get you anything. But I have to contact the people that know, you know. And also, have you any idea what is the annual budget number for substitute teachers? Yes, that, that we do have all that. Okay. Yep. All right. You don't know what that is? I'd have to get the <laughs> finance, financial paperwork <laughs> out. <laughs> yep. But there is, a, there is a budget line item for substitute pays, pay. And, um, you would also get that in your paperwork since you're a city councilor when you get the school finance booklet. Yep. So, well, thank you very so much. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Judy. And again, Judy is the Ward uh, 5 School Committee person, and she can be reached at 508-588-9171. <laughs> I make the phone call enough. I know what's uh, going on here. Yes, and the cards are available here, too. So now we're going to invite Terry McIntosh up here to speak briefly on what uh, she's involved with. Okay. Good evening. My name is Terry McIntosh. I'm the um, Vice President of the Brockton CPAC. 
Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Um, I work very closely with Laurie Mason, Director of Special Ed, and the Superintendent Kathleen Smith is very supportive of, of our PAC. Um, I'm also a parent, most importantly, and my children have always attended the Downey School. And as we're all aware in this room right now, that the Downey School does a fabulous job with special education students. They have some wonderful programs here. And as a CPAC Vice President, I'm trying to give back in a positive way to the Brockton Schools. Obviously, there's not a money, lot of money for these schools for any additional things that, you know, more outside activities for the children. A lot of things have been cut. Um, what I'm trying to do, I'm on a mission right now. I just um, went to the school committee for some advice and um, got some really good advice from the mayor, Superintendent Kathleen Smith, Laurie Mason and myself went. We're trying to get a playground for the Downey School um, that's handicap accessible integrated for, you know, um, so their children of special ed, you know, you have a lot of integrated programs here, some wonderful special ed programs, classrooms, um, so the children can get out, get out of the classrooms, use a playground. It's a big mission that I'm on, but I'm going to start it. Um, I'm learning about the grant writing. I'm, you know, I just wrote letters to the Patriots, every type of you can imagine. I'm just really going out um, now on this mission. And um, I'm getting a lot of good feedback from business owners, from um, residents. So I just wanted to come this evening just to let you all know that, you know, what I'm starting to do. I don't mean to keep saying I, but the CPAC, but they're not, there's a president, Michelle Keene, and then myself, the vice president. But we just kind of want to start giving back in a positive note to some of these schools because the teachers, in the special ed department, especially in this school, I'm very familiar with it, they're working so very hard. Your principal here at the Stoney School, um, he's wearing 15 hats. So I see this, we have this deficit with the financial, with, with the schools, how it's taken a toll on the staff. But I can honestly say in this building, what I observe, they're making it, they're keeping it going. You know, they're working hard. They're, the teachers, I mean, I don't see a lot of absentees here, you know, I know with the substitutes. I think that would be a kind of a concern to me as I'm thinking about a special ed classroom and there's the teacher's absent and there's not a substitute. Thank God there are paras in a lot of the classrooms. I think the paras do an amazing job and they would kind of have to step in if the teacher wasn't there because I would be concerned myself as a parent if, you know, that substitute wasn't here, what would happen? That so that's concerning to me, and I'm glad we kind of talked about that tonight. And my thought, as we're talking about the substitute, you have many parents that I think if they were aware about um, the situation with the substitute, maybe like we were saying it could be advertised. Um, there's many parents, I'm sure, that are home during the day that would maybe be able to do something like that, that have college degrees. Their children are at school, you know, you maybe might want to look in that avenue. I think there are some parents that might be able to do something like that. Um, maybe kind of reach out to the parent centers maybe, I don't know. That was my kind of thought when I was listening to you. So that's my mission, so if anyone has any, you know, advice or know of any great grants or anyone that wants to donate, I'm going to start at the Downey and get that playground. My, I'm very familiar with this school for years and I don't understand why we don't have one yet. And this went back 25 years ago. So, you know, the new schools are being built, they have beautiful playgrounds and you know, I just think we're going to start, we need to start at the Downey, and then my, I have young children in this school. So I'm, I'm going to be involved for many, many years, but it's not just for my children, it's for all the children here at the Downey. And then after I get this accomplished, then the CPAC will go on to another school and see what they need that, you know, with the deficit, they don't have the money to do anything extra. This, it's just so, I, I see it, but I, I will tell you, when I'm in the schools and I'm, the education is happening, the children are happy, the, the teachers are doing an amazing job. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the special ed teachers and the, the staff, but, you know, I just want to thank Ann Beauregard and Judy Sullivan. They've been very involved with helping me um, with this mission with the playground. So I just wanted to kind of fill you in on that. So, and, you know, if you have any advice for me, um, you know, we have a wonderful Facebook page. It's the Brockton CPAC, S-E-P-A-C. 
So just give me a little message there, and I'm very open to any, any advice, and thank you for your time. Well, thanks, Terry, and uh, so now it's another thing you people can get involved with, and the person that gets most people involved with everything is Lynn Smith, and she's going to be up here to talk about a really good uh, program here, and, uh, and uh, we have some handouts here, and of course, that's it. the trade is going to take place on the east side, right, you know, about three blocks away from here, but Lynn Smith, thank you, here you go, yes. So the first thing I do is I look out and I say, do you all know each other? Do you know each other? Is there someone in the room that you never met before that you need to introduce yourself to? All right, take a minute to introduce yourself if you don't know. Jeff. Jeff, welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Where are you from? I live uh, on Ames Road. And what brings you to the meeting tonight? I uh, just uh, want to hear what's being, Great. Uh, what's being talked about in the board. And uh, I also sit on the zoning board. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just uh, interested in uh, Board five issues, and I'm here just to meet my fellow neighbors and uh, listen. Great. Well, welcome. Right. I'm, I'm an attorney here in Brockton. You're an attorney in Brockton. Very good. And do you know Susan Nicastro, the Ward four counselor? So Jeff and Susan, now uh, you've met, and Jean is sitting next to her. Jean Lawton, who's involved in a lot of issues in the city as well. So. Good. 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 So anyway, uh, most of you know my name is Lynn Smith, and I've been involved in community organizing for a long, long time. And um, if you've ever heard of the Keith Park Neighborhood Association and the Easter Egg Hunt and the um, events that we do, or the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association, where the folks that brought you the little free libraries that are in um, Brockton, one of the things that we found out is that there are a lot of people who want to organize their neighborhoods, but they don't feel comfortable. They don't know how. They need a little help. They need a little guidance to be able to do it. So I have volunteered to lead six classes. We call it Team Brockton RLP, for Team Brockton Resident Leader Program. And what this program does is, number one, it gets you out to meet your neighbors. Number two, it gets you talking with your neighbors about issues, about programs, about activities that you'd like to see in your neighborhood. Number three, it teaches you how to communicate with the city in a little bit better way. And number four, it teaches you how to ask for money in a nice way. <laughs> so I invite anyone who is interested in learning this type of thing to join the resident leader training program. It's six classes, so you have to go to six classes once a month. We start February 7th at the East Branch of the Public Library. If anyone knows me, we start on time. 6.30, we start, because we want to be respectful of the librarians who go home at 8. So we start on time, and we finish on time. So what do we learn? We learn a little bit about the traits of leadership. We learn a little bit about people and how to motivate people and how to identify the assets that are people. We have some folks who graduated from the class. We use the Iroquois Nation medicine wheel. So all of us know that life is a circle and we know that there's a north, south, east, and west. And we know that there's a spring, summer, winter, and fall. And we know that most people identify with one of the quadrant animals. So you might be a buffalo, you might be an eagle, you might be a bear, or you might be a deer. And I'll just give you one example. The eagle flies high over the sky, sees the big picture, flies close to the sun, is the big thinker. But don't give the eagle the spreadsheet or the bank account to balance, because the eagle is not going to be able to do that. The buffalo is kind of grumpy, kind of paws the ground, kind of stands his ground, kind of gets the job done, doesn't like anybody to, you know, mess up his little lair. Perfect person to do the spreadsheet. Perfect person to be the treasurer. So we talk about things like that. We do icebreakers. I'll ask you to think about this. Which would you rather do? Hold a snake? or give a speech in front of 3,000 people. And so we talk about our own abilities 
and how we can identify those assets with um, people. We talk about operating principles, how to get a tax ID for the purpose of opening a bank account, how to craft an ask letter in terms of donations. And what we've done is we've convinced the city to set up a very small mini-grant program so that when you hit certain um, hallmarks in the program, when you hit certain uh, markers in the program, you're eligible for funding. But you have to write an application for your mini-grant, and we have designed it so that once you learn how to do that, once you learn how I, to identify what money you need to raise, what volunteer hours you're going to have, what in-kind contributions you're going to have, what the total value of the project is, you can write a grant application anywhere. So if you want to learn more about the program, I'm cheap. I don't pay for a website. So there's this company called Weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y, and you can have a free website as long as you have their name in the name of your website. So it's Team Brockton RLP dot Weebly dot com. If that's too much to remember, go on Facebook, find Lynn Smith. My picture is there. I think I have a Margaret Thatcher um, quote as my uh, <laughs> Facebook page um, profile right now. Or you can go to the Keith Park Neighborhood Association Facebook page or the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association Facebook page or you can go to douglasbrockton.org, which is the Douglas website, and all of the information about this training is on those pages. So again, Team Brockton RLP, learn how to organize your street. You know, there's that famous saying that says, be the change you want to be in the world. I can't do that. The world, come on. I don't even remember what I had for lunch yesterday. I can't do the world, but I can do my street. I can start there. And that's what this program um, does. So resident leader training starts February 7th, 630. You can sign up by going um, on the website. You can call me, 774-381-8050. But remember, you're committing to six classes from now until the first week of June. Any questions? How many people are you opening this? Well, we have about 30 who have signed up, and I'm going to be honest with you. Usually what happens is the first couple of weeks we start with 30, and by the end of it we end up with about 10 that make it through. Um, if you look over here at these two people, they're, they're not too black and blue, but Joanne and Sherry Lee went through the training, and Joanne and Sherry Lee started the Village Neighborhood Association for folks that live sort of in the northern part um, of our city. One united voice is sometimes a stronger voice than a lot of little voices. And so that's the whole um, purpose um, of it. All right, well, thanks for this opportunity, Anne. Thank you very much, Lynn. We appreciate everything you do. And again, we encourage people, you know, as Lynn emphasized, that you, know, you can get a hold of her, check this out. Remember, this is at the East Library. And uh, it uh, begins on uh, February, what did we see this, uh, February 7th. So am I, yeah, that's next Thursday. Oh, wow. Things are going by pretty quickly. We're going to end on the note of having more for city councilor. See if she has, a, Susan Castro has a couple of things to mention. I also, you know, want to keep on letting people know that there's constantly things going on that provide for people in the city. And this uh, Senior Community Service Employment Program information is available and this is an opportunity for people to you know be allowed to stay in their homes and uh, maybe in some instances get uh, you know heating oil paid for or uh, some tax deduction and there's a little bit more to this information uh, citizens for citizens dot inc and uh, also at uh, andrea burton at city hall can provide you with more information also she oh yes this is her number five zero eight eight nine seven six eight one three and she wants me to continue to mention that the broughton police and the mbta police are offering the um, pro, um what does i say the exam and uh, the last day deadline is uh tuesday february 5th and um, they're going to have opportunities for, uh, what I say, uh, 
open houses and explanations here at the Broughton Main Library on Monday, February 11th at uh, 6 to 8 to find out more about what's required of all this. So now I'm going to pass it along to my colleague here. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Yay. Here you go. Thank you, Councillor Beauregard. And good evening, Ward 5, and everyone in the viewing audience. I'll make this very fast. I learned so much from Councillor Beauregard. Her motto is to educate and to empower, and that's what she does every single day, seven days a week. Um, I've learned so much being here this evening. These meetings are so important. Ward 5, come out for a future meeting. And, and all across the city, go out for your ward meetings. We're, Councilor Beauregard and I and so many others, we're urging people to get involved in the city. We need you. The city of Brockton needs you. Um, please get involved. A local organization, your neighborhood, start wherever you'd like to and, and just, just help us make Brockton a better place. Thank you very much. This is the conclusion of our Ward 5 uh, meeting. I want to thank uh, Aaron Tebow for taping this. I want to take, thank Jen, who is the custodian here at the Downey School. It's been great letting people in and out. A lot of the people came out here tonight. My name is Ian Beauregard. I can be reached at 774-297-4939 or aboregard at cobma.us. There's a whole lot going on in the city. Again, as I mentioned, it's January 29th. And uh, we're, you know, a couple weeks, people will be thinking about February vacation. There's plenty of things going on for the parents and the grandparents to take the kids. There's plenty of things going on if you don't have any kids or if you're thinking about having them. But in all seriousness, there's a great deal going on. There's a lot of opportunities for businesses to start here. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities for programs, fun, art, and music, et cetera, that's, that's part of this community. And as my colleague mentioned, get involved. I mean, again, as I always say, you own this. You cannot put it on eBay and sell it. And you cannot have a yard sale. You own Broughton, so make it the, the best that you want it to be. Thank you again. Good night.